While we were at services last Sabbath, living in peace and harmony as one family, a hideous spectacle took place in Charlottesville, Virginia. I think all of us are very much aware of at least what has been reported on the situation, which is somewhat difficult because our media is so biased uh, one way or the other that it's hard to know exactly what took place. But what we do know is that there was a group of Nazis, KKK members, and sympathizers who had a march the evening before bring out all kinds of epithets against the Jews. And then on the Sabbath day part, uh, they came prepared for a fight. And there was another group of individuals who came prepared for a fight with clubs and so forth. Uh, clearly, these individuals were spoiling for a fight with one another. And that's exactly what happened and turned into somewhat of a riot, you might say, and ended with one of the white supremacists getting in his car, mowing down a number of pedestrians who were protesting in a peaceful manner, killing one individual. <clears throat> it was into this peaceful group that that happened. But this is only one of many violent protests that we're seeing in our world today. I think all of us are aware of the fact that the day before yesterday, we had an individual who rented a van and plowed into more than 100 people in Barcelona in Spain, killing 13 there. There was another uh, incident in another town, as well as a bomb that uh, blew up uh, prematurely, uh, thankfully, uh, killing the uh, individuals who were planning to blow up other individuals. We've seen this happen in England and France and elsewhere around the world. And we have also seen the hooded individuals that are breaking windows or were breaking windows at Berkeley in California, the University of California, Berkeley, setting things on fire. And I could give many more examples of hatred and violence around the world, not just here in the United States, but that are taking place around the world. Now, do we understand, brethren, what is really happening right now? Because the more common these things become, the more we get used to the conditions that we're living in. And we adjust to it. Uh, it's it's a, a mechanism, I guess, of survival that we begin to adjust to these things, and we don't always realize what's actually taking place. Can we recognize the fingerprints of the one who is behind these events, the fingerprints of Satan the devil. The telecast by Mr. McNair today uh, is interesting because he's saying that there is something behind the destruction of the family. And that is true, and it sounds to the world uh, as though it's, it's a stretch, but it really is true. There is a spirit behind the events that are taking place in the world today, and they are escalating at a very rapid rate. That program, by the way, by Mr. M uh, McNair, was turned down in Australia. If you think about it, because he's promoting traditional family values and did not include non-traditional families in the presentation that he gave. And we're finding more and more in Australia, specifically, programs turned down for very minor uh, infractions, as they would see it. Programs that have been aired already, in some cases, but they look at them again the second time, and they're turning them down. And we see this beginning to close in on the church, on anyone who has traditional values, as Google and Twitter and Facebook uh, these individuals are determining what is considered hate crimes or hate groups. And they can determine in their own minds, these liberal-minded secularists, what is a hate group, and they're beginning to put the squeeze on more and more. We have the Southern Poverty Law, whatever it is, laws, I think, I forget exactly the last word there, 
uh, that has set itself up as a group to determine who are hate groups. And they listed over 900 across the United States as hate groups. Do we see what's happening in our world today? And are we getting caught up in the emotional, uh, the emotions of what is taking place? Because it's easy when you see all kinds of things going astray and you see insanity taking place, whether it's on one side or another, it's easy for us to get caught up as individuals in what is taking place. So today we're going to look at what is happening, how our world is being torn apart, and who it is that's behind it all. And I think we know the answer to the last part. But we're going to see that racial strife is sin, that anarchy is sin, and that politically correct secularism is sin. And I want us to understand that we, as God's people, cannot allow ourselves to get caught up in Satan's world. Now, wasn't it wonderful last week when you came to services here that we could come together with people from many different places around the world with various ethnic uh, ethnicities as well as racial uh, differences, and we could come together in peace, and we could sit down at a table and enjoy some snacks, and that we could uh, talk with one another in peace and harmony. That's a wonderful thing. But that's not the world in which we're living. Yes, there are many people that can do that, but there are many others who are not doing that. We're at a tipping point in the world, a tipping point in our country. In fact, I personally believe we've tipped over to the side where we're never going to recover. I don't know how our country can possibly recover from the divisions that we have in it. How can you compromise on abortion? How can you compromise on same-sex marriage, which is not just two people being happy, but there is a spirit behind it. There is an, an anarchistic group that is behind these things that as soon as they cause one value to fall, they move on to the next one. Because they're not interested in people being happy. They're interested in power and in destruction. And a lot of people get caught up in it, thinking that they're just trying to help people be happy, but there are individuals behind these movements, and they're anarchists. They're people that just want to destroy and tear down, and there are names behind them as well, such as Saul Alinsky, who uh, was a, well, let me just read so that you know what's behind some of these things. This is from Rules for Revolution. Actually, it's written by a, a former uh, individual who was a radical, but uh, Rules for Radicals was published by Saul Alinsky. And in the dedicatory page, here's what he says. He says, lest we forget an over-the-shoulder acknowledgement to the very first radical, from all our legends, mythology, and history, and who is to know where mythology leaves off and history begins, or which is which, the first radical known to man who rebelled against the establishment and did it so effectively that he at least won his own kingdom, Lucifer. Interesting that Saul Alinsky, who is one of the radicals that's influenced at least one president, and a president's wife, a former president's wife, at least, uh, says that the first radical was Lucifer and praises Lucifer for being the first radical. This is what's behind some of the stuff that's going on in our world. How do we compromise on transgender issues? How do we compromise with radical Islamic terrorists? Are we going to sit down with them and come to an agreement? some sort of accommodation, uh, we are foolish if we think so. How do we compromise with Nazis, the KKK, and hate-filled white supremacists, or anarchists in general? How do we compromise on these issues? There is no compromise. It's either one way or the other. There's a winner and there's a loser. And frankly, rather than we're going to be on the losing side temporarily, 
but we will be on the winning side in the end, as we know. But temporarily, things are going to get a lot worse before they get better. The West is broken. Our universities are almost entirely secular. Whose fingerprints do we see in secularism? Our political system is broken, and we see nothing on the horizon to put it back together again. Whose fingerprints do we see in democratic rule and politics? We're no longer a nation of laws. Cities and states are defying federal law by sanctuary cities and even a sanctuary state. In other words, we no longer believe in the rule of law. Our lawmakers, our leaders, mayors of cities, governors, are violating the law. Whose fingerprints do we see in lawlessness? And our media no longer pretends to be objective. It's one side or the other, mostly one side, but a little bit on the other side. And nevertheless, they no longer pretend to be objective. Whose fingerprints do we see in division, in lies, and in the desire to destroy? Because that's what's behind much of what's happening in our media today. We see all of this internal strife, and yet there's, there are things happening in the world in a, in a bigger way. The Islamic uh, radicals that want to overthrow the, the West. We have the Korean situation. We have Iran wanting to get the bomb. We have an awakening in China. And as we know, a resurrected Roman Empire and the enforcement of the mark of the beast is coming in our future. It's important for us to know whose fingerprints we're looking at in all of these things. And I think we know, but let's just review 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 3, where the Apostle Paul said, but even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. Yes, these people are blinded to the power that's behind them, even the, the anarchists and the radicals. You may have a few that look at Lucifer as, as a, a hero, but many of them are just caught up in this. They don't realize what's behind it, what's behind the spirit of the age. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. Back in the book of John, Jesus made several statements about who the God of this world is or referred to the God of this world. In chapter 12 of John and verse 31, John 12, 31, he says, Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. The ruler of this world is going to be cast out. In chapter 14. And verse 30, he says, I will no longer talk much with you. This was on the night in which he was betrayed. And he is talking to his disciples. He says, I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of this world is coming, and he has nothing in me. He was the one that stirred the people up to crucify Christ. Or the 16th chapter and verse 11. He says, I, I should go back, I guess, verse 8. And when he has come, he will convict the world. This is the Holy Spirit of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment of sin because they do not believe in me, of righteousness because I go to the Father. Verse 11, of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world is judged. And the ruler of this world is going to be put out, as Mr. McNair was saying on the telecast there, and the ones to replace the ruler and his cohorts are going to be you and me, God willing, if we are faithful all the way to the end. Now, when we contrast what's happening in the world, let's look at the fingerprints of God. In Philippians, the fourth chapter, this is a very familiar scripture. But when we, we look at what's happening in the world, and then we compare to what happens amongst ourselves in our fellowship, he says in verse 8, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, 
whatever things are noble. You know, truth has fallen in the streets, as Isaiah predicted. We have absolute lies that are taking place today from the media, from academics, from the world in general. He says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Think about those things that we want to, to see, the things that are uplifting and positive. Yes, we have to talk about that which is not from time to time, but our, our focus should be on the positive. And that's why I say how wonderful it is that we can come together as God's people in a way that the world is not. While they're out there fighting their wars, in fact, I, even today I understand there are going to be more marches and more protests and who knows what's actually taking place right now. I, I don't have any idea. But we know that this is getting worse. It's almost a daily event someplace in the world, at least a weekly event. These things just stack up one after another as people who are filled with hatred try to force their agenda on other people or fight one another because they disagree, because there's such a divide that is taking place there. But here in, in Philippians 4, it says that these things which are good, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. What about Psalm 133? I understand this was Mrs. Herbert Armstrong's favorite psalm. I don't know that for sure, but I've heard it on several occasions. And it is absolutely beautiful when you think about it because it describes our fellowship. It describes the way that we are normally. Now, I'm not so naive to think that we don't have problems here and there. I've known individuals where, you know, two individuals be so adverse toward one another they wouldn't talk to each other. That's happened even in our fellowships. I don't mean here. I don't know of that here, but I do know in some of our congregations one or two cases of that. But he says, behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. Isn't that wonderful when we can dwell together in unity? When we can put aside the, the, the politics and all the stuff that's going on, and we can sit down and we can talk to one another and have love, genuine love, and caring for one another. My wife and I especially enjoyed, and I say especially because we really have loved all the congregations that we have served in. But the, uh, the London congregation in England and the Toronto congregation in, in Canada, or actually a couple of congregations there, are very multi-ethnic, multi-racial. And we just love it. My, my wife just loves the ladies there in London. And uh, I suppose the men too. Uh, and uh, because the differences sometimes that we have and how we express ourselves can be absolutely hilarious. Now, there were some ladies in another congregation she loved, although she could never understand them because they'd speak so fast, but they were, they were hilarious nevertheless. But, uh, and, and they were, they were totally English, but, you know, we, we can be together with one another and we can learn to appreciate the differences that God made. Instead of fighting those differences and putting people down, we can actually love one another. The Toronto congregation is such a warm congregation. Uh, you get a lot of hugs there. Well, I, I like hugs. Now, there's one lady that always leaves her makeup on my shoulder, but, uh, and then another one that uh, leaves a lipstick on my, my cheek. Uh, all, all very upfront and, and everything, but uh, then I have to wipe that off. But nevertheless, uh, it, it's warm, it's loving. And these people are of a different uh, race than I am, but we love these people. And I think they actually love us as well, which is uh, sometimes hard to understand, but uh, that is the case. How good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. That's the fingerprint of God. The fingerprint of Satan is quite different. 
Now, one fingerprint of Satan is that of being easily offended. In Luke, the 17th chapter, Jesus tells us that offenses are going to come. Luke 17 and verse 1, he says, said to his disciples, Luke 17, 1, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Now that's a warning for you and me to avoid offending people. We can't always avoid offending people because telling the truth is an offense to some people. And we have to be careful when and where we speak the truth, but nevertheless, we have to be truthful and open and honest, and we have to tell this world of their sins, and they're not going to like it. But he's talking here, in reality, about offending a little one. As it says here in verse 2, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. And when we look at Matthew's account here, back in uh, the 18th chapter of Matthew, we find that he's talking about really little ones, children, but we, I think, have always understood this being a little one in the faith, someone who is brand new in the faith. In the 18th chapter, verse 7, it says, Woe to the world because of offenses, for offenses must come, but woe to that man by whom the offense comes. If your hand or foot causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. It is better for you to enter into a life lame or maimed rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into the everlasting fire. Now, what is he talking about here? Well, if you go back to the context, he was talking about receiving little children to have hands laid upon them and a blessing to be given to them. And he's talking about offending one of those little ones. And we've often applied this in principle to a little one in the faith. And I may have told you this before, I, I may not have, after a while you don't remember where you've said what, but I, I remember an individual who's a minister in one of the other organizations, but a very dear friend of mine uh, over the years, and he, he told me when they first came to church, he was from the South, uh, I think one of their parents, either his or hers, had been an alcoholic. And they walked into services for the very first time after having a visit or two from the minister. And they sat down, and just before services began, this little old lady, I don't know if she was little, we always say little and old together, but this, this older lady, and they were quite a bit younger, so that older lady might have been 50, but it might have been 70, I don't know. Uh, that that it's, it's all relative. But this lady turned around to them out of the clear blue and said, do you know that we can drink alcohol here? <laughs> now, they almost didn't come back. They didn't hear the sermon because somebody said something that was so out of line. Yes, we can drink alcohol, but when you go back to the 60s in the South, it's sometimes bad enough today, but most of the, the churches teach that you shouldn't drink. Now, I, I, going down to uh, Matthew's uh, on a Friday evening before the Sabbath, you, you go down there and they've got these beer festivals everywhere. I had no idea they had so many microbreweries down in Matthew's. Uh, it, it was amazing. Maybe it was just a festival they had going on, but they had wine and beer and everything like that. It doesn't look like the Old South anymore, does it? But at that time, that was a shocking statement. And why would somebody do something like that? Well, sometimes people do dumb things, and hey, which one of us in this room hasn't done something dumb? So we, we don't have to castigate this woman that nobody knows, at least none of us know. I don't think so. But nevertheless, that's not the thing to do, is it? And yet it says that offenses will come. And that was certainly something that was very offensive to that individual. Offenses will come, but how we accept them as God's people is very important as well. 
When I moved into a new pastorate in one particular area, I was struck by how many people were saying, you offended me. Now, just for the record, they weren't talking about me offending them, at least not to my face, and not most of the time. But they were saying, well, this person offended me, or, or this person offended me. And I'd never been in a congregation where so many people were being offended by so many people. And I thought of the scripture in, in Psalm 119, 165, great peace have the, they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Now, if we are no longer a little one, we've been around for a little bit of time, and we have been baptized, and we have God's spirit, and maybe been in the church for two decades or four decades, should we really be offended by people? Sometimes people say to me something like, well, I hope this doesn't offend you, and I, I oh, actually jokingly, but I, I mean it very seriously, you're going to have to work real hard. Because after a while, you kind of get used to the idea that there are people out here who don't like you. People are going to say ugly things about you. And after a while, you just learn to accept it. And normally when they say that, they're not saying anything that should be offensive. They may just say, hey, I don't like your tie, or I don't like this or that, or whatever. But usually it's even less than that. But should we be easily offended? Because Satan would love for you to be sensitive and easily offended. And whether it be an ethnic or racial issue, maybe somebody says a word or uses a phrase that's offensive, but that person may be totally innocent in what he or she says. There's so many ways that we can be offended, and we have to be very careful about that and not allow ourselves to be easily offended wear our feelings on our shirt sleeves, we need to be able to look past what others might say. One of my favorite passages over in Ephesians, I was going to get there <clears throat> a little bit later, but let me just uh, turn over to Ephesians. And here in the fourth chapter, in verse 2 he says, With all lowliness, gentleness, with long suffering." Bearing one another in love. And I think that can be translated, and maybe I read it someplace else, that says, putting up with one another. Are we able to put up with one another? Sometimes we have people who hog conversations. Do we learn to put up with them? Or we might not like their voice. Or they may say, say things that are a little bit foolish. Can we learn to put up with one another? I hope so. I hope that we're not easily offended or that we are unable to be patient with one another. We have to learn to do so. How do we conduct ourselves in this broken world? Our world is broken, but how do we conduct ourselves? Well, first of all, we need to understand that the world is not going to like us. The values of the world are contrary to the values that we hold near and dear. In John, the 17th chapter, and verses 14 and 16, John 17, verse 14, it says, I have given them your word. He's talking about, he's praying to the Father, and he's speaking of his disciples. I've given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Do we realize that the world hates the message that we have? And it's becoming more and more apparent all the time. And it's, it's kind of frightening when you realize that they're beginning to categorize people into what they call hate groups. And if you get labeled as such, they can affect your Google account, your Twitter account, your Facebook account. They can keep you from coming up very, they, they may leave you there, but you don't come up very often on their searches. And when you're doing a search for this particular group, then a group that is totally contrary to us is what will come up. This is what, this is what Google actually is talking about. They have some new policies. They haven't, I don't know if they've been put in place yet, but that's where, where they're going. And yet these are 
organizations that claim to be neutral or whatever, and yet as one, they, one fellow that worked there wrote a, a memo, he found out what tolerance means. Tolerance is one-sided with these folks. It's one-sided. And they define what is hate. They define what is acceptable behavior. Our censors in Australia define what we can put on the air, what is acceptable for parental guidance. Now, I would dare say, and I, I should check that out when I go down there for the feast, that all kinds of things would be offensive to us. I say offensive, I, I don't mean we're offended by it, but would be offensive to what we believe, and that would be acceptable for parental guidance. But if Mr. McNair says that the traditional family is important and doesn't take into account, quote, non-traditional families, they decide that's not good for children to hear. It's a crazy world in which we live. It's so insane that it's hard for our minds, I, I say ours, I, it's hard for my mind to, to wrap around it. I don't get it. Well, I do, and, and that is that there's a spirit behind this, and it is picking up steam. And when we look where we have come in the last five years, where in the world are we going to be in 2022? Or 2023? Where are we going to be five years from now? It's hard to comprehend if we just take the, the, the progression of the last five years and project forward. It's going to be a very, very different world. <clears throat> In Matthew, the 24th chapter, Matthew 24, and verses 6 through 8, this is coming, and you and I need to be prepared for it, because I've said this before, and I think I've said it here. I think the greatest challenge that we're going to have, or one of the greatest challenges that we're going to have, is not to hate. Not to hate. We can hate ideas, we can hate things like that, but not to hate individuals. Because Satan is going to make it so ugly before it's over, with ethnic strife, and people being injured, and people being hurt, and people saying things, it's going to be hard, even for God's people, to avoid it. And verse 6, it says, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled. For all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. Ethnos against ethnos. Ethnic strife. Racial strife. That's coming to our land. It's, it's already here, as we saw last week. And it can get very, very ugly. And it's easy for people to get caught up in one side, on one side or another. And there will be famines and so on and so forth. So this is coming, brethren, and we need to be prepared for it. First John 2. 1 John 2. And verse 9, it says here, He who says he is in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Now people will come up with all kinds of rationalizations how to get around these scriptures. Well, that person not my brother. Or like the young man that spoke to Christ, he said, well, who is my neighbor? But this individual wanting to justify his way of life said, well, who is my neighbor? I guess he didn't expect that particular reply that Christ gave. So... He who hates his brother is in darkness. Now, that's why racial strife, racial hatred 
is a sin. This is why anarchy is sin, because it destroys, destroys the property of other individuals and is often violent against other individuals. And this is why, in, in a, and maybe this isn't the reason why, but there, there's another reason, and that is that secular, uh, politically correct secularism is also sin because it is against the law of God. So all these things are sin. And we need to make sure that we don't allow ourselves to get caught up in them, sympathizing with what they are promoting, what they're trying to sell. <clears throat> now, the fact that we are not to get caught up in this trap uh, does not mean that we are brain dead and have no opinions. We can look at these things and we can, you know, form opinions, but we need to make sure that we don't get caught up in the emotion of them. Uh, it doesn't mean that we uh, can't recognize right from wrong. And there are those who would say that what we believe about the LGBTQ, 2RS, you know, whatever it is, <laughs> movement. Oh, it's not RS, but it's 2S, two-spirit uh, in, in uh, some places. I mean, they, they've got so many letters here that, that follow that it's hard to keep track of them all. And so they just put a plus at the end now because they're, it's an ever-evolving uh, situation. But we know what we believe on that, and we, we, don't, uh, we don't buy into what they're selling, and they would consider us a hate group because of that. One of the things that I, I remember hearing from one of our ministers, it was an associate that I had, and he, he put it better than anybody else that I'd ever heard. Because we always say that you hate the sin, not the person. And that, that's true. But I like the way he put it. He said, it's kind of like someone who has cancer. You hate the cancer, but you don't hate the individual, do you? When it comes to a physical ailment, it's very understandable. But when it comes to the fact that someone is deceived by Satan or whoever it is that's deceiving them, it's a little bit hard to separate the individual from the sin, isn't it? But Satan has deceived the whole world. A deceived person doesn't know he's deceived. There's so many sincere people out there that are totally off base, totally wrong. And we have to hate the sin without hating, hating the individual or the sinner. So just think about that sometime when you feel a certain way towards somebody. You know, we, we talk about homosexuality as being a terrible sin, and it is. But read what Jesus said about Sodom. There are Matthew 11, 12, 13 in that area. There are about three statements in those chapters. Maybe it's 10, 11, 12, or it's 11, 12, 13. Where he talks about in the, the day of the judgment, he's talking about the second resurrection. It's going to be easier for the people of Sodom than it would be for those self-righteous individuals that Jesus was dealing with who saw the miracles but couldn't accept them. And he said, if they had seen what you've seen, they would have repented a long time ago. A lot of these individuals, for reasons that we don't always understand, are what they are. And while we hate the sin, and we will speak out against the sin, we have to understand that we have to still love the individuals. I remember an individual that I, I knew that was homosexual. And uh, one night, uh, walking home, some guys beat him up. And, you know, I really felt sorry for him because, because here was an individual that I, I knew the circumstances of his life, the family that he had grown up in, and he was really not all there. He was somewhat uh, mentally not quite all there. And, and I think that had I grown up in the same family, I, who knows what I would have been like under the same circumstances. So it's one thing to speak out against the activists who are promoting these things, and the sin itself, but we must not hate 
the individuals because God is going to give them an opportunity and many of them will be our brothers and sisters eventually or our children, however we, we want to look at that from the second resurrection. A lot of them will be in the family of God. And Jesus said that had they seen those things, they would have repented a long time ago. So we have to look at these things very carefully. So how must we live in this broken world? God has called us to a new relationship with one another. And we can learn some things from the first century of the church and from the scriptures themselves. Remember in Acts 10, verse 28, how Peter had to say, well, God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And that's because, because to the Jews, a Gentile was unclean. They were not to eat with them and so forth. And we find that even after that happened in Galatians, the second chapter, beginning in verse 11, that Paul had to correct Peter and Barnabas as well, who was called the son of consolation uh, because he was a, a peacemaker. But nevertheless, he got caught up in the hypocrisy of Peter at that time where before people came from James, before they came from Jerusalem, they would eat with the Gentiles. But then when these people came, they kind of separated themselves out because, because that was going to be easier than having to face them. And Paul corrected them publicly for that. Now that's the world of the first century among the Jews. Is there something we can learn from it? Well, the Bible is very explicit about the relationship that we should have with one another. In uh, Romans, the second chapter, Romans 2, again, very familiar passage, but I think that we, we do well to be reminded of some of these things. Romans 2 and verse 25, for circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law, but if you are a breaker of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Therefore, if an uncircumcised man keeps the righteous requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be counted as circumcision? And will not the physically uncircumcised, if he fulfills the law, judge you who even with your written code in circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh, but he is a Jew who is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart and the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. Now, if you have been baptized, if you are converted, I don't care what you look like, you're a Jew. So says the scripture, a spiritual Jew. I remember a young man that wanted to know if he was an Israelite, and I, I, I couldn't tell. I mean, he was, he was white. Uh, I said, I don't know. I don't know where you come from. A lot of people in this world are white that are not Israelites. And, and, and he kept asking me about it from time to time. I said, why is this so important? Well, he, he thought that he was somehow better. I said, I don't care if you, you're pink with purple polka dots. It doesn't really matter. Forget it. It's unimportant. Now, there was a, an advantage to being a Jew at that time because the oracles of God have been given to them and so forth. And our children that grow up in the church, there is an advantage because they understand some of these things. It's a way of life for them. They may still leave the church, but there is an advantage to them. But nevertheless, when it comes right down to it, if you are doing, as it says here, if you are circumcised in the heart, that's what's important. And when you go back to circumcision of the heart, you can go back to the Old Testament and find at least five or six scriptures that talk about being circumcised of heart. That's not a New Testament concept. That's an Old Testament concept. God wants us to be circumcised of heart. And if we are, we are a spiritual Jew. It also tells us in uh, 
Romans, the, well, let me see where I want to go here because I'm running out of time. Romans, um, we can look at Galatians. Uh, Gal- I'll just refer to Galatians 3. Now I'll turn over to it. Galatians 3 and verse 20 to 26. It says, Galatians 3, 26, For you are, are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. We're more than a spiritual Jew. We are sons of God. We're sons of God yet to be born, but we are sons of God just like a child in the mother's womb. It says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So we are heirs according to the promise. And it remains to be seen what we're going to look like in the resurrection. People ask questions. Will we recognize each other? Yes. I don't know how. Will we have the same facial features? What if we weighed 500 pounds? Would we come up 500 pound spiritual being? I don't know. If we're old and barely able to get around, will we look like that? I, somehow I don't think so. But we will know each other. We don't have to worry about that. But we're going to shine like the sun, like the stars. Some brighter than others, but we're going to shine like the stars. Read uh, 1 Corinthians 15. We're going to look like Christ. Maybe toned down a little bit. Not quite as bright, but we're going to have a very different body, a different uh, look to us. Uh, We may be like Christ who could manifest himself in different uh, forms. Remember, after his resurrection, they didn't always recognize him immediately. So he must have been appearing in somewhat different forms, but they understood at some point. And at one point, they could see the prince in his hands and the spear wound in his side. Let's go over to the book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians, or the letter of Ephesians, is is very interesting. We often read the book of Ephesians or the letter of Ephesians totally out of the context in which it was written. What's interesting here is that Paul is not sensitive about talking about Jews and Gentiles. That was the issue in his his day. And he's not afraid to say, you, Gentiles, and we, Jews. When you look at the the letter to the Ephesians, he uses a lot of we and us and you and your. And when we look at it carefully, he is pointing out that the Jews were called first and the Gentiles came later. But the bottom line is that we are one great family. Let's just notice a few things. I'm going to skip over a few things here, but read quickly. Chapter 1, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now, normally we think blessed us as being all of us. And sometimes, as he's writing here, it's not always clear. But I would suggest to you, when you read the whole context, when he says blessed us, he's talking about the Jews there with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Now, again, if you don't read Everything that follows, it's easy to say, well, he's just talking about all of us. And, that, and that's fine if we understand it in that context, because ultimately, it is talking about all of us. But in the original context that he's giving here, let's just read on, verse 7, in him, 
we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on the earth in him. And him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all in all according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ, which God first worked with the Jews, we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. Now notice verse 13. In him you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Now that was the good news of the salvation. As we shall see, he's talking to Gentiles, that that was great news. The gospel, the good news of your salvation. Now some people would like to cut that out of the scriptures because they think gospel of the kingdom is the only good news there is. But he's saying to the people of Ephesus that in him, in Christ, you also trusted. Not only did we trust in Christ, but you trusted in Christ as well. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having be believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you Gentiles were also sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption. The hour, hour there would seem to apply to all of them. Therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. So he was praying for those at Ephesus, primarily, again, Gentiles. That the God, verse 17, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Now, let's skip on down to, to verse, uh, well, verse 20, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body the fullness of him who fills all in all. Chapter 2, verse 1. And you he made alive. Now, we always apply this to ourselves. But let's just read through this and read carefully. He says, you he made alive who are dead in trespasses and sins. You see, the Gentiles at that time did not know God until Christianity came along for the most part. There, some may have converted Judaism, but speaking in a general sense, they were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. Now notice verse 3, among whom also we all, including the Jews, we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. So now he takes verses 1 and 2, and he includes in verse 3 that all of us were under sin. All of us, in a sense, were walking according to the course of the world. Verse 4, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, and the we there seem to apply to all of them there, uh, made us alive together, made all of us alive together, both Jew and Gentile alike. He made us all alive together with Christ. And it speaks of being saved by, uh, by grace. Verse 11, therefore remember that you once, you, once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, but at that time, you were without Christ. It's very clearly talking here about Gentiles in this context, being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope 
and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were afar off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And he says of them, verse 14, he himself is our peace. It is through Christ that we are at peace. Now, the, the reality is in our world today, most of us, I'd say in this room, were spiritual Gentiles. You know, I, if some of you were Jews and you knew you were Jews, but most of us growing up, I think we just thought we were Gentiles because we thought the only Jews were, were Jews. Uh, we didn't think that there were Israelites a, as such. So we were all in the category here of, of Gentiles in reality and in, in our way of life and everything. And as it says in chapter 2, verse 3, we were all once conducting ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling desires of the flesh and of the mind and so forth. So that's the world in which we were. But he's talking here to a world that's very different where it was divided into Jews and Gentiles. And he says, for he himself, verse 14, is our peace who has made both one, both Jew and Gentile one. Just as he has made of all races, he's made us one. As Jesus prayed on that night that he was uh, taken custody and, and crucified the next day, he prayed that we would all be one, not separate, not divided into ethnic groups or whatever, but we would all be one. And it says here, and has broken down the middle wall of partition or separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the animosity that once existed. And let's be honest with ourselves, there has been animosity between races. Maybe not with you, but certainly in our world. There's a certain element of animosity that does exist. A certain lack of understanding of one another's position on a, a particular subject. And he says here that through Christ he's broken down that middle wall of separation. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. The animosity that was once there, that is the law of commandments contained in ordinances. Now, people go off the rail on this, not understanding that he's not talking about the Ten Commandments, but he's talking about various Jewish regulations. In fact, let me just read here from a New Bible Commentary revised on this. Uh, let me read from Acts, the 21st chapter, because this is where Paul found himself in, in trouble among the Jews because of this individual that he had brought into, uh, uh, up to the, well, he didn't bring to the temple, but uh, they thought that he had. Uh, this is from Acts 21, verse 27. Uh, 21, 27. Let me get it here. Okay. I'll begin. Uh, yeah. Here, verse 20. He says, uh, who is teaching men everywhere uh, against this place that they what they accused Paul of says the charge brought against Stephen which which was uh, brought Greeks into the temple and he has defiled this holy place into the outer court anybody might go but further penetration was forbidden to Gentiles on pain of death the Roman government ratified the death sentence passed by the Sanhedrin for this offense even when the trespasser was a Roman citizen. It was a pretty serious offense to go beyond a certain point in the temple. Notices in Greek and Latin were fixed to the barriers, separating the outer and inner courts, warning Gentile visitors against further ingress. One of these notices found in 1871 is now in Istanbul, while another found in 1935 is in the Palestine Museum. So, in other words, there was this wall in the temple. This was not the law of God, but this was a law of the Jews. It was part of their regulations to separate the Jews and the Gentiles. The Gentiles could go on the outer court, but only so far. And there was a wall of separation with notices keeping them out. And this is what the Apostle Paul is talking about here, because the, the inner temple you know, pictured a, a greater relationship with God that yes, the Gentiles could come here, but they couldn't go into 
well, they, they couldn't go into the Holy of Holies, but I think there was a, an area that they couldn't go into with a, a closer relationship with God. And Paul is saying that, that uh, through Christ, that wall has been broken down, that we are one together. This is the law of command. Uh, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances or dogma, uh, uh, Jewish dogma, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, and that he might reconcile them both, both Jew and Gentile, to God in one body through the cross, there, uh, thereby putting to death the enmity. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. So whether they were far off or near, the, the Gentiles being far away, the Jews being closer as it were, and he's brought them together to be one new man. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father. We have equality in that way. Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And he talks about the foundation of that. The third chapter, verse 14. Or let me go third chapter, verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles... If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to you. So again, just showing that, uh, that there, that uh, uh, a difference. Verse 6, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ Jesus or Christ through the gospel. And he says in verse 8, to me, who am less than least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And then in verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from, which, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. And then in the fourth chapter, he speaks of uh, coming together. There, there's one body, one spirit, verse 4, as you were called in one hope of your calling. He talks about bearing with one another, in love in, in verse 2. So we see here that they had problems back in their day. And Paul was bringing them together. He was showing how God has brought us all together with one spirit. We have one father. We have one older brother. We are to be one people in every way. We have a sermon by Dr. Meredith on our church family. It was uh, June 26, 2015. You can look that up. But I think it's important that we recognize the family nature that we have. It's so important that we not allow what is happening in the world to tear us apart. If we can see the fingerprints of who's behind these movements, and then if we can understand the fingerprints of God, of one great loving family, if we can recognize the difference. Let's go to John 13, and I'll just conclude with that. John 13. <clears throat> you know, this is... Uh, this is so very important in a, a world that is torn about with strife. Again, the night that Jesus was <clears throat> eventually taken into custody, he says this in verse 34. And I'll, I'll finish this sermon. And for those who, who need uh, titles, it's the sin of racism, intolerance, and anarchy, or the sins of those, the sins of Racism, intolerance, and anarchy. But in verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. Jesus gave his life for every single one of us and a lot of other people out there as well. That you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, all will know that you are my disciples. 
This is how people will know if you have love for one another.